33 story hotel and condo project. I'd probably be okay, like, like that. Okay, stop. Tap. This is a plan by the community for the community. This one here. <laughs> no problem, Ken. Thanks for having me. It's Kent Mogat for Kelowna Now. And we're joined by Luke Stack, three-time city councillor, going for four. Yep. So, um, in our earlier discussion, I, I, I thought it would be nice for people to learn something about you they didn't know. And I take it you've taken up this pickleball craze? Oh, yes, I have. Yeah, I'm old enough now. I'm 61. <laughs> so, Is that uh, only an old folks game? No, actually, young people are starting to take it on. But it really caught on really big with the, yeah. with the senior generation. They, they've just gone nuts over it. So the Kelowna Pickleball Club had, uh, last year when I joined, has 450 members. It's the fastest growing sport in North America. And um, people really enjoy it. I what do you because, like about it? What, what? Well, it's very economical. I mean, you take out a membership and you can play for a whole year with virtually no cost. Uh, $75 for a year's membership. And uh, it's very sociable. So when you play, you play with four people on a court. And I usually go by myself. So I'm always with three other people. So I get to meet them and have a discussion with them and have a little bit of socializing and wow. have some exercise. It's also a game where you don't have to work... You don't have to run super hard. Like it's a small court, right? And uh, so you know you can be a little less mobile. If you, it's kind of right. funny if you go to the courts, you know you look at every second person's got a knee brace on or an elbow right. brace or something. So right? a little bit of agility helps, but you can kind of get by w with that's right with a good wrist and just have fun. It's the yeah. kind of game uh, where it's simple enough that you can have fun as a beginner, but it's it's there's enough skill involved that there are many levels to how well you can play. Right. And so those that really want to go for it, they can put a lot of effort into it and become very skilled players, like a five-level player. Uh, or you can take it on just simply as a hobby, and right. you can stay at the junior levels. And it keeps you in shape a little bit. It keeps you in shape and gives you lots of fresh air. So let's get on, get on to some issues that are important to you. Um, I know that uh, you are involved with the Society of Hope. You're the executive director yes. uh, of, an, of an organization that has been working to get people into low-income housing for decades. Yeah. So a lot of people look around and say, what can we do about low-income housing? Well, you've at least been trying to address that through that organization. Yeah, yeah. we've been chipping time. away at it for uh, 29 years, which I can hardly believe actually, but we came up uh, way back in the 80s with a saying, hey, can we do something about the affordable housing? You know, And we had a particular interest in helping single parents with children because they were having a heck of a time getting a place to rent and so we started and had some success with a couple of very small projects and as we got more into it we started doing larger projects we expanded into family housing because there was a huge demand for family townhomes right. as there is today yes and uh, seniors housing there was a big demand for seniors so we just every every year that we saw an opportunity we would build another project or advance it a little bit further and and uh, when you add it up over 29 years, you end up with 700 of them. 700 homes. Yeah. It's over that many years. That's not a huge number, like per year. It seems but like a huge number to me. <laughs> but it's hard work. I mean, it's yeah, the, it is. Right. Yeah, it takes a lot of time because a project takes you know from the initial inception to the time you can uh, cut the ribbon is usually about four to five yeah. years. So you must be learning a lot about all the challenges and intricacies and what the demand is for low-income housing that probably helps you when you get into discussions around the council table. Well, I think Kelowna, Kelowna is a really interesting place. Like, we love living here. I love living here. I'm sure you do as well. And people, um, we've put a package together for our city. Like, to, this is back from a city council perspective. And those that were on city council before my day um, had a vision for our city. And that vision included having a beautiful health center. So we've got the uh, Interior Health Center here in Kelowna. The Cancer Center is in Kelowna. Uh, attracting university, uh, the University of British Columbia to Kelowna and having them set up. Watching Okanagan College expand. And then one of our gems is the Kelowna Airport. You know, it's an international airport, which is a great destination airport. You can leave our country and go on vacations from here. So when you put all those things together, uh, all the building blocks are there to make Kelowna a very attractive city. Uh, on top, of, I haven't even talked about the beauty of the area and the magnificent lake we have here. And you, you put it all together, and we've created an environment in our city, which is attracting people from all over Canada. Yeah. You didn't and even mention the downtown, the, the improvements oh, in the downtown yeah, over the last few yeah. years. I mean, I've said this before. I, when people come to visit, I'm proud to show them, yeah, especially the you get into twilight and, and all the yeah. lights downtown. It really is beautiful. Yeah. When I first got onto council back in 2008, uh, the mantra in those days was fix the downtown. You guys have to do something with downtown. 
and uh, it's taken many, many years. But uh, there was Remember a couple Stuart of key Park things. got started and stopped, yeah. and that took, seemed yeah. to take forever. Yeah, but attracting Interior Health to, yes. to move their offices downtown was a very, very big uh, win. Uh, the Innovation Center opening it downtown and attracting high-tech uh, investment into downtown was a big win. Uh, the repurposing of Bernard Avenue with expanding the sidewalks and taking away some of the parking and right. making the sidewalks large. Yeah. And finishing the yeah the waterfront. Uh, it's it's been a long effort, but I've sensed over the last couple of years we turned the corner, and now we're seeing all kinds of new investment coming into downtown. Well, all of these high rises. I think there's yeah. about six big ones. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. Um, but now the biggest one of all, uh, the West Corp uh, building, is now it sounds like it's in jeopardy. At, le at least it's on hold or held back. It's in a back delay here. mode of some sort. But yeah, I'm very disappointed, truthfully. And I, all about the speculation tax. This, after so much went on around the around city uh, city council, even finally approving something uh, against the recommendations of yeah. staff. Obviously, yeah. there was a willingness to see this happen, and now maybe not. Well, I'm I'm of the opinion and have been for many years that we need another major hotel downtown. Um, uh, the Grand is wonderful, but we just need more facilities that are enough to help attract uh, conventions and and visitors to this community. And uh, I felt. Uh, even though there was some uh, issues with the hotel, like how high it was, et cetera, uh, that it was better for the downtown overall to have that hotel than not have it. And that's why I supported it. So and, they're, uh, they're blaming the speculation tax? Yes, they are. It, it, my observation is that that tax probably wouldn't affect very many of the purchasers, but just the very presence of it is an irritant and it creates a negative feeling. And in real estate, that matters. It does. So yeah. even something that is really shouldn't be such a big deal becomes a big deal. Well, it becomes a big deal when they start delaying uh, projects that are very significant to our community. And I think having that hotel downtown at, it, at that location is a very important signal. And I had even used that, that this will be a beacon to, you know, sort of showing uh, off what uh, the the rebirth of Kelowna's downtown has been. We've heard so to have a delay yeah. is, is, is a disappointment. Well, I, I've heard the suggestion uh, from local mayors that instead of the tax as it currently is structured, there should it should address the real issue by becoming some kind of a flipping tax. That's right. Yeah, and the uh, UBCM uh, actually had a great debate on this, and uh, all over the province, uh, the cities uh, got together and they made a recommendation that they would support uh, a true speculation tax. But that tax would would focus on the transaction. So, for instance, if an investor bought a unit. Uh, and didn't ever move into it and sold it for more than he bought it for, he would be taxed heavily for that. So the idea was to put uh, some disincentive in place for people just to tie up real estate with the hope it's going right. to go high. And so that it. way, real estate could be purchased by people who actually plan to use it, That's whether correct. that means That's living right. in it or having it as a vacation yeah. residence. So if this particular person made an investment and moved into the house, uh, no problem. There would be no tax at all. But if he decided to sell it before he ever took possession or sell it sometimes in Vancouver, that you'd see a property will sell three times before someone ever moved into it. Okay, so the UBCM puts that has put that forward? Yeah, and lobbied very hard to our current provincial government to say that type of tax we would support. Is that even being they don't seem to resonating? Want to do no, they don't seem to be interested They've got their heels in dug in on that one, it seems. It seems to be, yeah. So I don't quite understand their logic of it because I don't think it's going to have the desired outcome. And that's why it's been very... Uh, bizarre, really, for uh, us to watch, you know, the implementation of this uh, policy. City Council has been taking some hits over the Diamond Mountain project being turned down. A few, yeah. Um, so uh, how do you explain why the city would say no to, to that? Maybe, you know, people well, first need to hear of all, that again. It, uh, the, the whole plan is you know, something called an area structure plan, and that's where a developer comes and says, I want to develop a large area. But to do a large area, we have to think about the roads, we have to think about um, uh, parks and amenities, uh, we have to think about everything. And it takes about 10 years to do an area structure plan. It, it's, a, right. it's a long process. And uh, in this particular case, the developer was in working on this area structure plan. All that time. During all that, yeah. And, and being they, encouraged along the way. So I think that a fair complaint might be that the, the developers were sort of led down a bit of a garden path to find out at the end that, yeah, no. Um, I don't know if I, I would say they were led down a garden path. What I would say is they were very uh, committed to the vision that they had for that. Um, I think the city had reservations along the way, and that's why one of the that's one of the reasons why we did the the, the studies that were done to determine if odor, dust, noise, 
uh, would affect that property. And yeah, for people who don't know, this, 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 is, this is the one that is practically on the doorstep of the landfill. Yes, it's right across the street. So, um, yeah, so the, the proposal was to build a, a large re a residential development across the street from the biggest landfill in the central Okanagan. Yeah, and I take it the, uh, the, the, the thinking was you move that many people into a relatively dense housing development, and in the future they're going to say, as the dump expands, and that's the only plan for the future of our waste disposal, eventually you would be faced with, why did you approve something here? This, this is affecting our well, What we feared is um, you know, the developer can say, hey, it's not going to be a problem. But I've learned over the years, once people start buying homes, living there, they don't care what was said way back when. All they know is if they wake up one morning and they can smell um, methane gas or if they can smell something, they're going to complain to the city saying, you need to fix that and make it go away. Yeah. But the problem is we can't make the landfill go away, go away. So in this particular case, the landfill is where it is. It's not going anywhere for 75 to 100 years. And it is one of our most important assets in this, in this community because if we don't have a landfill, it means you have to ship right. your product, your waste product somewhere else. This is Very just a, a, the kind of thing a city council has to make a decision on, and sometimes yeah. you end up really disappointing people. Yeah, and, I, and the developer was very disappointed, but, but part of the reason we asked for an area structure plan is to, to explore all these things. And as we uncover information and get deeper into it, which is the way an area structure plan works, uh, sometimes, yeah, this turns out to say, you know what, this is, this is not a good plan. Right. There's flaws in this plan, and unfortunately in this case it led to a to a, a negative decision that we just said, you know what, the, the, the concerns we have at council are greater than the need for the housing, truthfully, right. because the landfill is a vital asset to this, this whole area, the whole central right. Okanagan. Um, still on the housing front, we're just getting into the warmer months where more transients come into Kelowna and this is a huge issue right now. We've got yeah, our is. Journey Home Task Force hard at work and um, do you think that task force is going to come up with recommendations that actually take shape into something? Yeah. Because, you I know, do. you can say a lot of platitudes, but do we have any real solutions showing themselves? Um, well, I think what the Journey Home will do is they've, they've pulled everyone together and, and really driven home the point that everyone has to work together as a, as a team to, to help work on this problem. We can't have a bunch of silos where everyone's doing their own thing. Uh, they will come up with a plan to show how, we're, how everyone's going to work together. <clears throat> but the reason I think it's so important and the reason they've invested a lot of time in this is the federal government and the provincial governments are prepared now to make big investments into helping with housing. And they're going to be looking to communities who have their act together, who know what the problem is, have been able to quantify it, and have some recommended options to pursue. And I think where the journey home is really going to pay off is Kelowna will be well situated to say, hey, we have a plan. We have some ideas on how we can uh, well, help ha reduce homelessness. Housing first seems to be sort of the mantra that yes. people sort of come to, but that sounds expensive to me. And I, th I think is. there needs to be a commitment to actually spend the money to try to cope with this problem. I agree, and, and but the word we keep getting from the province and the federal government is, yeah, they're gonna spend some money. So they're gonna be looking for proposals from right. cities that that have ideas and from organizations that have ideas. And so I think the is journey it, home it, timing is very, very crucial. Is it possible that we spend a ton of money resolving it and it actually saves us money? Because maybe less policing and, and even running like this temporary shelter is not cheap either. No, it's very expensive, yeah. So, you know, it seems like spending money, but it could ultimately be an investment, no? Um, well, I don't think the journey home's been that expensive, but I think there will be big investments no, to, to I do mean, the housing first. I mean first. what they recommend in the end could be expensive. I, I have no doubt it's going to be expensive, whichever way we go. Yes. Uh, housing people who have very limited income uh, is expensive. But as you say, living on the street's expensive. If you spend you know, three nights a, a month in, in, in the ER for some reason, uh, that's expensive. You know, mm -hmm. If you need social uh, services to help, that's expensive. If you need... You know, or, uh, or if your life is so in such disarray that you're committing crimes repeatedly, yeah. that's expensive. Yeah, all of it's expensive. So, but there has, although the Journey Home has been working very hard the last few years to come up with a strategic plan for the city. Uh, in the meanwhile, there are other things happening. So, BC Housing has been opening right. different housing first opportunities. We have Gordon Place uh, opened up last year, and it's housing 40 people. We just approved the right. other day the one on Commerce Avenue for the another heart, heart 40 stone. Stores. So we're yeah. not, in the meantime, so those things are, we're, are not, moving yeah, forward. we're not standing still on it. So yeah. people want to hear some encouraging news on that front. You know what? I think people really, they just want to see the homeless problem go away. 
Well, it's, 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 and it's that's not, not going to happen, is it's, it? It's not. It's, it's, uh, I don't blame yeah. people because it, 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 it's not nice to see. Like Nobody wants to see someone sleeping on the sidewalk and nobody wants to see um, people pushing buggies around downtown because it makes them feel uncomfortable. And, um, and the sad reality is, is uh, you know, we have a shifting demographic. There's a lot of people that are homeless and, mm -hmm. and trying to house them. I mean, the city has been working with nonprofits for the last 15 years. And we built hundreds of housing first units. And what sometimes people forget, they say, well, you know, this problem's been going on for years. And I say, yeah, and we've built hundreds of units. Right. You know, we've built the uh, Newgate up in Rutland. We've uh, seen Willow Bridge go mm -hmm. and come on stream. Touch Street has come on stream. Cardington Apartments on St. Paul. Remember how much that was? Uh, but they're all full. Right. All those units are now in the marketplace. And they're occupied. I'm afraid sometimes there's a false promise that we're going to in some way solve homelessness. I think we need to be become better at coping with it and managing it. Yeah, yeah, I think we can do a better job and that's what the whole Journey Home Task Force is to say, can we do a better job? Can we coordinate more effectively? And I think the answer is yes. But are we doing stuff? Yes, we are. We're doing it all the time. The problem that I've been frustrated with on a personal front is we find housing for 200 people and then we go back on the street and find there's 300 more. That's the frustration I have. Yeah. It's like new people show up that are suddenly in need and, and it's what, not going away quickly and that's what, my frustration. One highly placed politician years ago said to me, Kent, if we, if we build housing for the homeless, they're going to see that and more will just move in. And that may be partly true, but you've got to do it, right? Yeah. It could be partly true, and you do have to do it. But this is problem is not unique to Kelowna. I mean, you can talk to Vernon, Kamloops. Uh, I was in Hope the other day, <laughs> and I was reading the front page of the Hope uh, newspaper, and it said, oh, we have a homeless problem. We had 21 last year, and we have 39 this year. Oh, my God. It's doubled, right? And I thought, <laughs> hey, I get it. I mean, yeah. you know, every small community in British Columbia is suffering from, right. from people who are having real troubles. And, and it's not like the homeless people we would think of 30 years ago where some guys, they used to say, you know, oh, he's down on his luck and needs a little help. It's more entrenched. It's more entrenched. Uh, there's, uh, in, in some cases, not all cases, there's a lot of drug and alcohol abuse. Mm -hmm. um, and the drugs are, are really worse. Having, the drugs are worse yeah. now. They, it's you really know, tough. I walk through this area and the attitude of the people who are in these circumstances, it's it's edgier. It's it this, is, yeah. The drugs they're getting access to now aren't the same. And Yeah. Like we... No one had even heard of an naloxone kit a few years ago, right? It was yeah. new information and, and some of the drugs that are on the street, like I hadn't even heard of those things before. So it's a, it's a tough challenge, but uh, it's nice to know that someone's got their eyes on, on yeah. the prize on, on Well, the, the Journey Home Task Force, I have a lot of confidence that they'll come up with some good ideas, but that will be the starting of another journey. And the next journey is going to be to try and attract some federal and provincial money to help find enough money to house people and to right. give them a path back to normalcy is really what we want to do. So we like to keep these things to about 10 minutes. We've blown way by that, I'm yeah. sure, but it's it's really interesting talking to you. You can mm -hmm. just start cutting a whole bunch of it out. <laughs> we'll leave it. <laughs> Thanks, Luke Stack, a member of City Council, running a, a, again in the upcoming election, and you're watching Kelowna Now.